Guten Tag, mein Name ist Sander Schröbers für Helungyangs Internationale Universität. Ni hao. That was German. I just said, hello, my name is Sander Schröbers for Helungyang International University. And I welcome you to yet another uh, web lecture on European business skills, our online course explaining you uh, the major cultures of the European Union. Today, it is truly my pleasure to introduce you to Germany. Germany is the diesel motor of the European Union economically, but I think also for China, it's becoming more and more important. I welcome you to learn more about the Germans. At Heilung Young International University, we strive to help our graduates to find global careers. Um, and as such, uh, the European Union is uh, an area of future chances. If we look at um, the trade in goods and commercial services, it's actually not the United States that is the biggest, it's the EU, uh, much bigger than many other uh, uh, business uh, trade partners of the People's Republic of China. Um, since 2013, we now see that there is a yearly EU-China summit and the European Union is China's largest trading partner. Um, we saw that in December 2019, uh, China's Foreign Affairs Minister Wang Yi uh, called for the launch of free trade talks with the EU, meaning that there is no more taxation on any products or services. This will really uh, be a game changer. The problem is that there is not one Europe. They are all independent countries uh, with uh, their own culture and their own language often. So we have decided to offer you a course called EBS. And uh, we have the 27 member states, uh, so not the UK anymore after Brexit. We can't do them all online. Uh, so selection, uh, call it in blue, is part of the EBS online course which is videos that we offer you and part of it will be direct lessons taught at HIU in Harbin. But for now I would like to say Hallo Deutschland, Hello Germany. Germany is situated right in the heart of the European Union. It's the dark green country um, and Fly first to Beijing and then it is about ten and a half hours flight directly to Berlin. Um, time zone differences is standard Chinese time six hours earlier. The internet code is dot DE, DE for Deutschland, and the phone or WeChat country code is 49. Language uh, often is a key to a culture and I am proud to be working for Heilung Yang International University which is one of the top ranking linguistic universities in China. Uh, fantastic. Um, I myself had to study German uh, at high school for five years and after high school I thought now I want to speak better German. So I actually went to study and lived in Berlin, West Berlin at the time, to improve my German. And I can say that actually, for me, German is a better language, is a language I speak better than my English. Um, I had a own company in Dusseldorf, in the western side of Germany. Um, I've been writing books in German for a German publisher in Munich. Of course, I make a lot of mistakes, but people there at least help me. Um, and nowadays I still teach and I give trainings uh, in German language. Um, I love Germany, I feel very much at home uh, and I often still work there as a guest speaker and also often as a business consultant for German clients and I uh, do this uh, in the German language usually. So let's talk a little bit about language. Um, these are two books that I uh, have written for the Dutch market in Holland and uh, the top one is how to make phone calls in German and the second one is a little booklet on how to write emails in German. Uh, they're best selling <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, they're necessary because it's a difficult language, but it is a beautiful language. It's the language that Goethe and Schiller, famous uh, poets, but also a lot of classical music is often in and from German. 
And therefore, it is so nice to say that HIU is only one of the few universities in the People's Republic of China that actually have the status of an official test DAF prüfung. Prüfung means testing. Um, and uh, for the north part of China, HIU is the test center uh, uh, for test DAF, the official German language test. And uh, also uh, at HIU, you can do excellent trainings in the German language, which I strongly recommend. Uh, because often we say uh, in my country that uh, a German sells in English, but buys in German. So if you are exporting uh, or looking for collaboration with German firms, it really would help to speak German because often a lot of the written information uh, is in the German language. We look at the German Chamber of Commerce in China. It has more than 2,000 member companies. Um, and we see that more and more uh, financial investment from Germany is coming to China, and actually much more even the other way around. Um, if we look at the imports uh, by European Union uh, 27 countries, we can actually see that uh, Germany is the second largest importer. and as such, uh, it is double of what France or Italy or Spain are doing, or triple of Spain, actually. Um, and that means that the potential of you working for a Chinese company, you probably have to go to Germany quite a lot to go to the trade fairs, or as they're called in Germany, Messe, uh, to uh, explain about the products that you can uh, deliver to the German market. Uh, 2,000 German companies are member of the German uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, but uh, more than 5,000 companies are active in China. Altogether, they have jobs for more than 1 million people in China. I think uh, HIU graduates could be among them. Um, you have to realize that 25% uh, of the cars sold in China are German cars. Uh, if we look at the bilateral trade in 2019, it is more than 200 billion euro. These numbers show that the German-Chinese economic relations are really well developed. And that means that there is a place for you in this perspective. Um, if we look at the German economy for export, uh, China uh, it means Germany exporting to uh, China. Uh, it's the fifth trade partner. Uh, if we look at German imports, um, since 2016, China is now number one uh, before it used to be the Netherlands. And if we put these together, Germany is the largest trading partner since 2016 of the German Federation. Another thing is, is foreign money coming in. Now, if we look at the total, so worldwide, uh, the top 10 countries by receiving uh, FDI, receiving foreign investment money, um, I have uh, listed this in uh, Renminbi. Um, the Netherlands is number one, the US is two, but in fact, China, if you include Hong Kong, which of course is uh, a China, uh, it is actually number three. Um, this will go up in the future because there is a new law uh, that has uh, been um, put in place uh, this year, actually in 2020. Um, we see that another thing is that the foreign invested enterprises, so uh, foreign money in the Chinese economy, accounts for 60% of Chinese import and export. And that means a lot of jobs for global minded HIU graduates. This is the law that uh, is uh, starting now. Uh, we see that um, Europe has become, since 2014, uh, a much uh, more important destination for Chinese uh, investments uh, around the world. It used to be a lot Africa, but now it's really becoming Europe. Um, we also see that the increase of technology acquisitions by, by Chinese companies has made politicians a bit wary and more careful. And now in the EU, there is investment screening. Uh, if it's like uh, um, important uh, um, sensitive technologies or critical infrastructure, it's not that easy anymore. 
and we also see this is still uh, going until 2016 and we see a rapid uh, increase the blue line is the chinese investments in germany the red line is the german investments in china but we also see that the political influence is now it's going down again however china is still at this moment uh, investing more in germany than germany in china um, Germany is one of the founder countries uh, of the euro currency and the banknotes are all the same. The coins, however, have one European side and the other side is the national side. This is the national side of the euro coins for Germany, where we see the German eagle on top and the Brandenburger Tor um, in the middle in Berlin. The thing about payments in Germany is that people really still kind of expect cash shopkeepers will really look strained if you at you if you're trying to pay with a credit card it's often really not possible even um, let alone pay with alipay or wechat pay um, it is not yet part of the german uh, people don't like uh, to pay digitally um, if we look at uh, the Wi-Fi, it's usually bad. In the cities, it's good, but in the countryside, it's really bad. There's very low email speed. Um, so it is somehow your, your Chinese expectations will not work. You need to walk around with cash again. Your mother a long time ago. Um, here we see uh, that the, the Germans and the Chinese are working closely together on a financial level. Um, and that makes sense because China has the largest foreign exchange reserves in the world. There is so much accumulated capital available in China. Uh, Belt Road is often invested with this overflow of money. Um, let's go to Germany. Here we see a beautiful old city of Freiburg. There's not a lot of old beautiful cities anymore after the Second World War because uh, the airplanes of the RAF and the, the American Air Force, they have been bombing uh, basically every place in Germany. But there are a few left. Freiburg is still very pretty. I want to talk with, to you about deeper cultural values. Now, a culture is a little bit like a tree. Uh, a tree has uh, what we see out above the soil, but actually the same size of the tree is also under the soil. And that is to make sure that the tree with strong wind cannot fall over. Um, culture has the same. There are values that we feel and that we can see. There's also values that we don't really see. And I want to talk to you about the deeper German values and where this will create for Chinese maybe a problem. We have been able since about 30, 35 years with the use of internet and computers, we can now measure very effectively. So we can ask thousands of people. And based on this, we have discovered that there are national average scores. And of course, the national average scores of Germany are very different from those of China. And I know China is big, even Germany I feel is big, but still we can see that there are predictable average scores. One is, are we task or relationship oriented? The Chinese are very relationship oriented. The Germans are really not. And that means the way you behave, you invest a lot in giving gifts, having dinner together. The Germans don't. So they feel it's strange because it's their private time and you feel you're left alone. And this will cause some problems for you in the beginning when dealing with Germans and it will also cause problems for Germans that are not used to working with Chinese. We see this and we can see that China is on the far right side of the relationship. We see that France is in the middle and we see that the Americans, the Danes and the Germans are really on the task. And if you are task oriented, you don't have any polite or friendly conversation. You just send the deadline and you are concentrating only on the job that needs to be done. And I think for many Chinese, this will be rude and unacceptable. But for Germans, this is the normal way to deal with things. So it means your strategy of how you collaborate with people is not working very well because they are completely the opposite 
of your average Chinese expectations. And I think you need to think about that before you start. We see that in conversations, this also means that uh, people spend less time on it. They don't have any small talk. They don't want to waste time. They immediately go down to business. Um, in the nonverbal, it means also that they will write everything down because writing down, if you don't invest in your relationship, you need to have some kind of system that organizes the agreements and the expectations. And Germans like files. They like to file everything. So for them, written information with details is very important. Again, back to talking. Um, in China, you would be very polite and you will hold back when there are problems or something you don't like and you leave it to you know the feeling germans don't understand feeling they don't understand silence uh, germans like what you what they call themselves to be honest maybe for you it's very rude but it's very important to understand that they will directly tell you if they don't like it and they have no hesitation in doing so uh, which for a chinese is unacceptably rude in a german uh, perspective it's called honesty the other thing is that you really need to look people in the eye and also if they're older and uh, have a higher hierarchical function you need to look in their eye not too long but long enough because otherwise they think you're lying should we tell them that we agree or we don't agree as you can see there is a big difference between Germany and China um, so to disagree even with a senior hierarchical uh, person who is a president or something, it is possible if you do it with the right respect in Germany, it's actually expected. If you have knowledge, you have to share the knowledge. It's called transparency. Whereas in China, you would never do it. The most direct cultures in the world are the Swiss that speak German and number two the Germans they will immediately say it if they don't agree with you or if they feel that you do something wrong students will tell the professor uh, this is not okay I don't like it uh, in the classroom and um, this is maybe for you uh, surprising but it is the way it is fun facts about Germany no fun in Germany go back to work um, often, if you read American or English uh, uh, books or, 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 or websites, uh, social media, they make jokes about that Germans have no sense of humor. This is not true. Um, Germans have fantastic sense of humor, uh, great comedians, but um, it is not professional to make jokes during work. In fact, it is just really not done. So when Germans make jokes uh, during a, a meeting, it's often not so funny because they, f they hesitate. They don't feel comfortable with it. What you should also do is that when you make planning, the Germans want this very, very detailed. And they want to have that at a very early stage. And a tip that I've done sometimes wrong, you can never change the planning. If you change the planning, especially if it's last minute, they have no respect and also no trust in you anymore. It will make you look very unprofessional. So humor and changing the planning or not giving a detailed planning. So to collaborate effectively with Germans, you need to start much earlier with a very counting back in time and making a very detailed kind of gun chart of what you do when. Um, in China, it's much more flexible and it's much more last minute. What you think is okay in Germany is really not okay. It cannot be done the last minute. It's unacceptable for the Germans and probably they will not like you as a business partner. What you should not do in speaking is to be very modest and shy. Um, and especially for girls uh, in, in China, you think, shy is good but trust me for germany it is not good what germans would prefer is very straightforward honest answers to the questions 
and also transparency in sharing of information. If you be silent, the Germans will call it dishonest. So it's very important that you do that. Another thing is, um, in China you're very flexible, and that is a, a making you often very fast in responding to situations that need changes. The Germans will freak out if you do that, but they will freak out more if you ask them to change their mind. They cannot do it. If they have made a decision, it's almost not going to be changed. And if it's going to be changed, it is according to fixed processes, protocols. These are very important rules. I think the most important element of German culture would be Ordnung muss sein, that means German for there needs to be order. And order is defined by a lot of regulations and rules. At a very young age, Germans have to learn to deal with rules for everything and you never break the rule. In China, it's much more flexible, it's much more diffuse and it depends on what the president is doing or the top of the organization is doing. And that's how you quickly adapt and follow that line. In Germany, it's completely the other way. It's always by the rules. Uh, and order is order. If you get an order, you cannot change the direction. You have to follow up on the order. Now, another thing is, is that there is a strong compartmentalization of time. That means that there are very fixed blocks of time and these are predictable and people are expecting it. I noticed that when meetings in China take place, they're much more fluid. They're much more like in Latin cultures, where it is depending on what the, the top says, not in Germany. In Germany, there's a very strong box of time that you have available to look at certain things. And that is how a meeting should go. And only that way. And if you are referring to a point that has already been done before, in the meeting agenda, people will not accept it. Time uh, after rules, like procedures, uh, is the most essential part of German culture from my perspective. The schedules, the procedures will lead to efficiency. And uh, I think most German people will see uh, work as a process and it's a process that is very scheduled and if you don't follow the schedule and also if you don't have the schedule um, they will not like it and they will not like to work with you if there is if you're a student and the deadline is 11 o'clock and you email your work at 50 minutes past 11 in Germany you have failed that task you will get a, a bad note um, in, my, in my country it doesn't matter, but you have to be on time. Um, I think Germans need a, a very, very detailed planning at a very early stage, weeks before you think you should do something. So if you want to collaborate effectively with Germans, make a very detailed planning and never, ever, ever change the planning afterwards. That is my recipe for working good together. I think if we look at what leaders and managers in German organization want is transparency. They want to be able to predict what is happening when and why. And for that, all relevant business information and processes need to be shared. In China, this is often not done, um, uh, but this will not work effectively with German partners. Um, Germans want consistent processes because they want to control the processes. Um, there are things that you expect when you work with others. The expectations in China, averagely, are different from the ones in Germany. There is no better. It's not that Chinese is better or German is better. It's just good when you are working with a lot of Germans and you're the only Chinese. It's better to know what the expectations on the German side are. Um, often, the Germans working in China or with Chinese are frustrated that the Chinese colleagues uh, are not doing what has been agreed in a meeting. Often the Chinese, to be polite, say yes, but the Germans think when you say yes that you are going to do what you said yes on. So it is uh, impossible when the decisions are being made to just stay silent and want to do your own thing. Um, 
because the Germans think, yeah, but we have reached an agreement together. Why don't you do what you said you would do? So flexibility is a difficulty for Germans. They cannot accept flexibility. They want very detailed planning and never any changes to the planning. And the other thing that they feel is difficult is the close personal relationship because they don't want it. They just want task as we talked about when we started it. It doesn't mean they don't like you. Uh, they do, uh, but they just feel it's unprofessional to have a very close personal relationship. So you can do that outside of the office when you have food together, but it's not part of doing professional business. One more element that sometimes surprises me when I'm longer in Germany is that people can criticize strangers, people they don't know, on the street uh, if you do if you make a mistake in traffic or with zebra or traffic lights they will tell you actually in public like you are you know breaking the rule and it's accepted in germany and i'm not sure if in public you would talk to somebody going to the wanda mall and said sorry this is against the rule um, another thing i noticed is that you will almost never get a compliment if you did a good job because people think that you are supposed to do your job uh, and there is no compliment if you do what is expected of you. That is your professional side. It's very strong, this kind of duty feeling. Um, well, you can see that, 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 you know, elevator buttons are different. Um, the E means ground floor and then the U means cellar. So cellar one, cellar two. Um, like I told you, in Germany, you don't need a personal relationship um, to be good at your work. Actually, the Germans prefer to separate. So work is only about work and friendship is only about friendship. And you can have friendship with people from work or business, but actually they don't feel comfortable if you invest in a personal relationship. The other thing is that usually people have the door closed, so you need to knock on the door. Uh, whereas in America or the Netherlands, the doors are often open. In Germany, it's more a bit formal, probably like in China. My main message is that you cannot do what you feel is normal in China and expect that to work in Germany. In fact, this is a disaster uh, uh, approach. You really need to think about who you are who they are and how you can bridge that divide efficiently. You need to prepare. Values that will make you better prepared, but you can't just take a plane and think it will be all right. No. So my suggestion, learn adapted strategies. Here we see the beautiful city of Hamburg. It's a, it's a really nice place. We don't always go there, but Hamburg is nice. It's cool and has a lot of bridges and water and uh, it rains a lot. Um, I wanted to go back to German, the German language. Uh, some things that are surprising when you talk about the language, there are some differences. For instance, the computer. Uh, in window computers, you need to do control, alt, delete. Uh, what are the buttons for that in German? Because the keyboard will be a German keyboard. And in fact, the keyboard is different because as you can see, uh, it is um, uh, Q, W, E, R, T, Z. It's not a keyboard. It's often <laughs> called a CAS board because the Y and the Z are different, but there are more differences. As you can see, we also have different letters on it. Uh, and as I ask you, what is control or delete? Well, control is Steuerung. Uh, uh, control alt, alt is the same, and delete is called Entf Entfernung. So they really have different keyboards, and that will make it difficult for you to type. There's more, because my theory is is that if you see the the O with the little points above it, it's called an Umlaut. Uh, and my theory is if the sound changes the meaning, in this case, schön is not the same as schon, then usually you will find it back on the keyboard of the computer. And we do. They have four different letters on this. The U, 
De E, de E en de double S, de SZ-zeichen. That's why I think for me this is really strange, uh, because we see a bus with a a bus with a dirty word on it and most Germans think yes but it's a different letter it's not a U and I just see a bad word um, they also have uh, I think German is a very strong language in that sense that you can glue all kind of words together in English you always need to pause with a space between two words in Germany they come together and that makes uh, a German dictionary much thicker than an English journey because they have much more words. You can glue all these words together. Uh, they also have words that are difficult to translate. In this case, it's an Schilderwald. I told you that Germans really like rules and they also want to communicate the rules. And as a result, in traffic, we see an enormous amount of rules on road signs. And in Germany, you can see a lot. It's called Schilderwald, I have a, a word for that. Another one is called Fernweh, I really like that word. It means feeling homesick, for longing for a place you've never been. Fernweh, isn't that beautiful? Um, this is not beautiful, uh, but I want you to speak some German. Here we see the city of Munich and a beautiful full red moon, and we can see the Alp Mountains. And on the other side of that, we have Austria, Switzerland, and already soon Italy. Uh, Munich is not very far from Milano in Italy. Um, good, let's talk German. Uh, first, I'm going to let you take a look at the first one and then let's repeat after me. Fischers, Fritz, Fischt, Frische, Fische. There you go. One, two, three. Eins, zwei, drei. Fischers, Fritz, Fischt, Frische, Fische. And number two. Kluge kleine Katze, Kratze, keine Krokodille. One, two, three. Kluge kleine Katzen, Katzen keine Krokodille. These are what we call tongue twisters or Zungenbrecher. The trick is to really pronounce it really, really fast. Kluge kleine Katze, Katze, Katze. Good. Here we see beautiful castles. There is a lot of castles still in Germany. Um, they uh, like to go out in the weekend and usually can have some food there. There's some hotels in it or you have wine, uh, white wine tasting. Uh, castles and it's fun break that you can do with uh, your family uh, i can recommend it if you're in germany visit some castles there's some beautiful ones some really and, and you're really tired when you're up so then you have the good food there size matters um, the white little with the blue lines under shanghai and next to hong kong that is the size of germany and compared to china it is totally small I think that Germany is a huge country because I come from a much smaller country. But as you can see, both population with eight, more than 80 million people uh, and 350 square kilometers, China is so much bigger. But still, Germany is, I think it's actually a big country. Uh, and it, my image of Germany is the Autobahn. The Autobahn is the highways and... Uh, yeah, you always be on the autobahn for a long time uh, and it makes the uh, the country very quickly to move around. People don't fly that much in Germany because it's not necessary. And the good thing is they make very nice German cars and you can drive at some parts of the autobahn, the highway, as fast as you want. And my German friends that sometimes take me from Cologne to Dusseldorf, they do so and they drive 230 kilometers an hour. And this is so fast. I think if you sneeze, you have a car accident or you die. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, part of Germany is always, you know, being on the Autobahn. That's how you travel. Or we take the train. They're very nice. Uh, not as fast as the Chinese trains, uh, but still really good. And, and uh, ICE. Uh, it's called, that's the fast one. And then also you have the Regionalzug, the regional. Uh, uh, and also they have the S-Bahn, which is only in city regions. And that is a kind of a slow train, a bit like a subway, but then up higher. And in cities, you always need to transfer between, you know, the regional or the, 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 inter, the intercity chain, uh, uh, trains or the S-Bahn to quickly move around in city area. Good, let's work together with China. This is Angela Merkel, she's been in the lead, but she always holds her hand in a certain way. Uh, so this is uh, my joke version of the German flag. Um,
there now is also an Angela Merkel puppet. In fact, you can buy a Barbie uh, that uh, represents her, although I think they don't really look that much the same. And even the haircut of the Barbie is slightly better. Sorry, Angela. Let's talk about food, German food. You don't see a lot of German restaurants, although in China I see some beer restaurants, but then it's more the beer than the food, I think. Uh, but it's a very fatty uh, kitchen. Uh, but if you're really hungry, it's good. Uh, there's a lot of meat. Germans eat meat already for breakfast. Uh, a lot of it's a, a lot of bread. And then also, what are some typical? So we should talk about bread. Um, the German bread is very very heavy, um, and and it's uh, it's usually darker because of the rye uh, the, 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 in it. Um, it was originally made commisbrot. Uh, is uh, noted because it's it's very long time it will stay fresh it doesn't uh, it doesn't get mold it doesn't rot um, and that's because originally it was made for the army so that it could travel long trips and would have something to eat and it's also very nourishing so it's only after 1905 that they started to sell it in normal bread shops bakeries but it used to be specifically made Germans love it they hate other bread they don't like the bread in China the other second thing would be wurst uh, jokes about German sausage are the worst uh, sausages they are everywhere there is a lot of pork meat uh, Is the classic at the moment um, there you have it uh, it is any place in public there will be sausage bratwurst you have but currywurst now is the one it's a sauce it's not that old um, but there is now in Berlin even a German currywurst museum do I like it not really but well, I would never say that in Germany I prefer Chinese food the third classic in German culture would be German beer. Germany is a beer country, and that's a fact. Beer is always the right choice. There's countries where they say, oh, this goes well with wine. In Germany, it's not a problem to have delicious food and drink beer with it. Beer is holy. Um, it can be consumed without any problem in a train, in a bus, in a subway, and people are actually drinking huge cans of beer sitting in the train right in front of you. And you think, that's not legal. But in Germany, it is legal, in the parks, everywhere. What is, um, you have uh, the, the, the Trinkhalle, the Späti, which 24 hours a day will serve you uh, alcoholic drinks in public. Um, and what is really classic, uh, is the beer gardens. If it's nice weather and you are in Germany, go sit at the beer garden. It's really a traditional part of German beer culture. And sometimes you have these traditional ones that are a few hundred years old. It's beautiful. You sit under trees that are more than a hundred years old and it's a very enjoyable place to do that. Um, if you're allowed. Um, beer is actually not seen as alcohol, but it's seen as part of daily food. If you go to the south, uh, Bavaria, uh, even if you are taking a flight to Munich Airport, which has direct flights to, to, to China, um, then people for breakfast actually have Weisswurst with uh, Süße Senf, with a kind of uh, 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 sweet mustard. It's called white sausage, and you get a half a liter of beer with that for breakfast and you can see it at uh, Munich airport they already serve it early then there is something uh, the purity law the Reinheitsgebot and um, yeah, often people say this is to prevent export of uh, foreign beers uh, but uh, it, there is a, a law in Germany from 1516 so 500 years old which says that only you're allowed to have pure ingredients and no chemicals Germany is the biggest European beer producer, but the Netherlands are the biggest beer exporter in the EU. And here we have the Southern German Lederhose. For the guys, it's the leather pants. They're really made of leather. They're very expensive. 
uh, but you can buy uh, Chinese leather lederhosen, which are a lot cheaper. Uh, on the left, we see the soccer players of uh, uh, Bavarian, uh, of uh, Bayern München, the, the the football team, and uh, in the middle the classic dances. And on the right, we see a lady holding a small glass of beer. Yes, we call that small. Uh, and she's wearing a Dirndl Kleid, which is a traditional German dress for the south of German. Northern Germans have nothing to do with it, it's only the south. Then we have the Oktoberfest, that's when a lot of people do this and drink in huge tents in the area of Munich. Um, however, it's called Oktoberfest, but it always takes place in September, because October, the risk of catching a cold is too much. Okay. We hope that you will enjoy, and uh, yeah, Germans call this small glasses of beer, uh, because in Germany they're bigger, um, and you should, you know, toast, but don't break them, uh, because there's a liter inside. Okay, so how much money do people spend at the moment on food per month? And my question is, which is the right one? Chad, a country in Africa, 19 euros a month. Poland, Central Europe, 150 euros a month. Mexico. Latin America, 190 euros a month, or Germany, 295. Well, the right answer is... Chad, 19 euros a month. And this is one month of food in the country Chad. And the Germans don't spend that 295. They spend 500 on average a month, and here it is. And as you can see, Ordnung will sign. There needs to be order. Everything is neatly uh, positioned. We can see a lot of beer, uh, and also we see uh, the mineral water with bubbles. They like that. A lot of meat. They love meat. Then we have the situation that there is a lot of immigrants. A lot of people like to go to the UK, but also a lot like to go to Germany because there's good jobs there. In fact, um, there is an aging population. And at the moment, uh, Germany needs about 250,000, a quarter of a million immigrants per year to cope with the consequences of an aging population. So those are statistics. Also China probably needs to import foreign workers because of the one child policy you will have a problem with the labor market uh, germany has a comparable uh, issue with a growing uh, uh, with a, uh, an aging population um, if we look at the history of germany uh, germany history is a bit strange because it's always been unstable if we look at the borders of it um, and what we see here is the Reichstag Gebäude, it's the, the, the German parliament um, that has again become the German parliament uh, with the unification of East and West Germany. Um, but to name some famous Germans, Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher, he was actually uh, born in Kaliningrad, which is now called, uh, which is now called Russia. At the time he was born and writing his philosophic work, it was called Königsberg. Strasbourg, uh, where the inventor in the west uh, of printing Gutenberg, because of course in China and Korea you already printed way before the Europeans. Um, he lived uh, in, 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 in what is nowadays France. Uh, Wolfgang von Goethe, um, he was writing his books uh, again in Strasbourg. Strasbourg is a German city if you look at the architecture. Nowadays we would say no, it's France, but historically it's not that simple. Here we see a picture. It's a, it looks like a painting, but it's actually a picture. It's Helmut Kohl, the former Bundeskanzler, <coughs> the, the, let's say prime minister of, um, of Germany. Uh, and he's in front of the Brandenburger Tor, which divides East and West Berlin. And I know it at the time when it was full of guns and other things. So for me, it's an amazing uh, scene to see. Um, and also, it's an historical place. Now, uh, in Germany, it's not very much talked about. But nevertheless, to give you an indication, um, Germany is, uh, is uh, uh, before the war and after the war has shifted considerably. Large parts of it uh, have moved, and so has the population. Um, 
because this is nowadays Germany. And as you can see, a third or more is peeled off. Um, if you go to these cities, and tomorrow I'm flying to Poznan, that is a German city. Uh, it is a German architecture, just all the Germans had 48 hours to leave. Uh, I'm not justifying history, uh, but I just want to put it into perspective. Um, so there is a lot of uh, things that happened. Um, and also historically, it's not one country. Uh, unlike France, where you have Paris as the center and everything in the hexagon is built around Paris, uh, all, the, all the institutions, uh, all the big corporations, they're there. Germany is a federation. Germany is uh, polycentric, meaning that it has multiple centers, economical, political centers, powerhouses that are spread over the map, and actually not so much in Berlin. Maybe it will change, maybe not. Um, the thing is that if you are in business, you have to realize that you need to know where you need to be. It's not an idea of going there. Now, if we take a look at the top 100 largest companies, uh, German companies, only three of those hundred have their headquarters in the capital Berlin. Um, so uh, it means that you need to do your homework in order to succeed uh, in, an, uh, in an economical uh, framework. And this is a map where you can see the logo of the company. Uh, and where its main seat is. And as you can see, I just said there's only three of them uh, in, in Berlin. Uh, well, uh, here we are. Uh, and, and you can see that they're, uh, and they're on mainly governmental ones, you know, like, like the, the, the German railway and that sort of thing. And Air Berlin, which is already bankrupt. So as you can see, uh, it's the West uh, that is the powerhouse, a little bit around Hamburg and again the area of Munich and Stuttgart. Uh, but even Frankfurt is not that much. Uh, so, yeah, you can see that you need to know where you want to go in Germany. Home is where the dome is. This is uh, Cologne, Köln, uh, as it's called, or Kölle in the local dialect. Um, I want to talk a little bit about marketing. Marketing in Germany is slightly different. So if you have a brochure, a website, PowerPoint, maybe social media, you cannot just say we're the best in this market. You in Germany really need to prove it. Germans have a very strong uh, risk uh, redundancy uh, need. So they like to take away uncertainties. They do that with rules and they do that with information. If you as a Chinese are able to provide very detailed background information of the products you have, the tests and everything, they will take you more serious and they will like to do business with you. Um, so if you are giving a, a presentation, you need to talk about facts, facts, facts. You need to prove the facts. You need to show patent numbers, testing certificates, you need to talk about how many years you guarantee your product, you need to show certifications, sizes, measures and tests. So basically prove facts a lot more than you ever would do for a Chinese website. Another thing I noticed is that part of the marketing is that actually you try to get into semi-scientific magazines with your product and that's something i've never seen in other countries so it's a very typical german thing so if you are trying to export to germany good price is not enough it is more about guarantees how many year of guarantee and how much information do you give to take the risk away that is how you sell in germany as a long term they're not from the the quick business and i think a lot of chinese businessmen could do better if they prepare better. And this is my strong advice for doing business with Germany. Ordnung muss sein. So I talked about risk redundancy, organizational desire, risk avoidance, and don't make jokes because it's not professional. Those are the things that are the key together with planning of uh, the German mindset, the German expectation, and how Germans will look at you and how they will judge you if you're a stable partner for the future. An example of this is how you get a job in Germany. They work with the so-called um, Bewerbungsmappe. A Bewerbungsmappe is how you get a job in, uh, in China. And this means that you need to give a lot of facts. Every paper that you have needs to be uh, photocopied 
and proofs with official stamps. Also a photograph of you. You buy special binders, which is called the MAPA, the Bewerbungsmappe, uh, and they can be quite big and often there's a little uh, framework in the beginning so your photo is even visible outside of the binder. Just an idea, but you see that the first parking places in German parking uh, uh, garages are often reserved for women. They're called Frauenparkplätze. If you're a man, you're not allowed to park there. Of course, it's a sexist uh, photograph. I'm sorry, sisters. Here we see um, the beautiful Friedrichshafen, uh, close to the Swiss-German uh, border. Um, and I would like to, to finalize a little bit with what collaboration and possibilities are there for Chinese uh, more interested in the German uh, culture at home. Well, if we look at the Sino-German business cooperation, uh, it is, it is two-way. Uh, we see that J Chinese companies are investors in Germany, but they're also customers in Germany, suppliers in Germany, and business partners of German companies in China. The Chamber of Commerce in China has 2,285 German companies that member, but also 30 Chinese companies as friends of the chamber. So I think more are possible to enter there if you like. You should check the event of the Chamber of Commerce. There are many local chapters where you can network and you can meet people. Then we have the uh, uh, AHK, uh, that's the uh, part of the, the Handelskammer of the German Chamber of Commerce. Here you can see the WeChat uh, QR codes. Uh, they have uh, th three different uh, regions and uh, there's all kind of information and you can see what events they organize. There's plenty. That is an excellent way to network, to probably also find jobs. Then in Beijing, uh, not too far away from, from uh, Harbin, we have the young professionals. It's the young German professionals. So anybody who is a university student, uh, who is just starting to work for a company, who is an intern at a company, they can be a member. And this could be a very good way to meet young Germans that are uh, working in China or studying in China. And that allows for good networking or social professional events. They also organize all kinds of parties and you have to see where they go if you can just join them. Um, what it includes is a typical uh, German aspect. It's the Stammtisch. That is a classically a wooden table where you would all sit together and uh, drink beers together. And this is for people that have work placements. There is after work networking, parties, food uh, things, company visits and social activities. It is possible for people who are of the age between 19 and 35 and that's you. So maybe there you can meet interesting Germans. Um, then we have WeChat uh, Deutsche in China, means German Germans in China. And Facebook you don't have, but if you use uh, something on your phone where you can see Facebook, then also you got Doi Chin, which means Deutschland, China. Um, and you need to ask Manuel if you can join. And this way you can uh, get all the information of the activities they are undergoing and ask if you can be invited. Uh, the direct networking way, the Guangxi, is uh, very essential in getting things done. Um, this is me in my uh, lederhose. You can't see my legs, but believe me, it's short trouser and the typical uh, shirt with it. And the two two of my students that are Germans and are wearing a classical Dirndlkleid. Um, I would like to say, take a flight, uh, go to uh, Germany, uh, explore it, see it. It's a great place to study, although you should maybe consider speaking a little bit of German. English is not very common in, Germ in Germany. But as they say, tschüss, or tschüssi, which means goodbye. Thank you very much for joining.